Welcome back to Canna Week, brought to you by New Frontier Data, where we deliver the week's top headlines in cannabis and hear experts weigh in on the impacts these stories are having on the industry. I'm your host, Heather Wickline. Before we get started, if you are loving this podcast, please be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss an episode. All right. Today, we are thrilled to have this guest. She um, is a 30 year plus, has 30 years plus experience as an entrepreneur, venture capitalist, turnaround expert, board director, corporate leader, attorney, and former federal prosecutor who is really uniquely qualified to not only lead companies in cannabis, but to advise regulators and pro- provide a strategic investment advice. She is a longtime friend um, and investor of New Frontier Data. Please welcome Sherry Orlowitz. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me, Heather and John. Appreciate it. Yes. And as always, please welcome back the leader of our amazing research team, New Frontier Data's Chief Knowledge Officer, Mr. John Kagia. Delighted to be back, Heather. Thank you for having me. Yeah. See, we're never all just old friends here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Sherry, talk to us. You have this, I mean, amazing career. What yeah. made you pivot to cannabis and, yeah. and, and when? I pivoted to cannabis in uh, 2015, and um, I live right in the line of sight of the uh, of the uh, White House. So excuse the helicopters; it's kind of cool sometimes. <laughs> um, I am um, kind of a weird duck, um, a unique duck. Not a lot of women ran manufacturing companies or did leverage buyouts, and as a result of that, I had to raise a lot of capital. And a lot of women became very interested in the fact that, you know, from 93 to 2000, I raised about $100 million. I ran eight companies, um, acquired and bought eight companies that um, from various uh, corporate um, entities and started a couple of businesses. And the women's movement was really interested in me. And so I became a big um, proponent of helping women to access capital. And a woman came up to me and told her daughter wanted to expand her landscape business. And could I help her raise five to $8 million? And I said, that is just right up my bailiwick. That sounds terrific, have her call me. And uh, PS, she called me three weeks before the application from from Maryland in 2015 was due. Lovely girl, we talked. I shut down all my other business. My team went and worked on it for three weeks straight and they actually won the license and I had never had anything to do with the industry before on that side, but I was a federal prosecutor who worked with these laws quite um, frequently for a couple of years. Amazing. And you are the founder and board chair uh, for the Council for Federal Cannabis Regulation, uh, CFCR, which I normally refer to it. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what you're doing and you know how you got involved in this. Love to, thank you. Um, CFCR is a independent nonprofit and its goal is to see that the, the way I sort of say it as the dreams contained in legislation actually hold true in practice. And that is all dependent on the regulations. And one of the things um, I learned as a regulatory lawyer for the United States is the um, real uh, nitty gritty is in the regulations. How this industry will develop is in the regulations. And the federal agencies uh, needed someone, in my opinion, to, um, to share education with them um, and to help to destigmatize the industry in their eyes because those of us over 40 grew up with the evil weed and it is always there looming in the subconscious of most people's minds and no one was focusing on that area at all and in um, my experience the difference between an and and an or in regulation could change an entire industry so i believe we have First, I believe I had and my team has the ability, almost like Navy SEALs, to figure where the most um, impactful place we can weigh in with the federal agencies. And right now, the gatekeeper is the FDA. And so our focus is the FDA. We have a science and regulatory affairs team of six to eight people at any given time. Um, Our scientists are mainstays, and we have associates that rotate. Um, And we really think that education is critical for both sides, both not just the uh, federal agencies, but all industry, cannabis and and otherwise. Right. Well, we're going to definitely dig into that a little bit more um, later. 
But um, first, let's talk Safe Banking Act. Marijuana Moment reported. <clears throat> Marijuana banking sponsor says he is in amendment talks with Senate leader as House passes reform for the sixth time. So it seems like we've been here before. Um, it's once again cleared the House, um, this time part of a larger manufacturing and innovations bill. So Sherry, is sixth time a charm? And what, if anything, is different this time? Um, I think it's crapshoot. Uh, it depends on the negotiations and conference committee, as you well know. It's a must-pass bill. Um, that we have appended it to. And um, it really wakes up the morning of the day the vote is taken and Mitch decides, Senator McConnell decides that it makes sense and whoops, we have a bill. Um, it's that much of a crapshoot, in my opinion. John, what's your take on this? We've talked about this so many times. <laughs> we have, and I think there's incremental gain, whether it's in the orientation around members of Congress, the, the legislative staff around what cannabis actually is. Um, I think if you look back to where we were kind of politically around the conversation on, on cannabis six, seven years ago, um, by and large, most members of Congress were totally clueless to, to um, the arc of what was happening in American society, the speed at which um, state level reform was happening, the, the um, pace at which the industry was commercializing. Um, now there's much, much deeper familiarity. And so with each cycle that this doesn't happen, there are more better informed, better oriented uh, uh, stakeholders around the table who in, in many cases are now representing um, uh, businesses, representing communities where cannabis is now legal. And so even if it is just kind of chipping away at this massive iceberg, this incremental progress, because each time this comes up, more people uh, are, are paying attention to it. But I completely agree with Sherry. Um, I saw a, a release from McConnell's office where apparently he was calling it a poison pill in this must pass bill. We'll see what that means for the ability for this bill to get through this time. Um, but to me, it, it, it just further underscores this idea that this is a question of um, uh, when, not if, and for all of the instances in which this keeps happening, um, I think we've now crossed the, the Rubicon where this is no longer an oddity. The tension is less about whether this is the right thing to do or whether this is going to happen, but rather how can it get done in a way that uh, allays the concerns of conservatives but has the expansive uh, reach that, that uh, the, the liberals in Congress might want to see. Uh, that's the tension more than about whether this is an absolute no. And I think it's going to be a tough, tough, um, particularly given our current political climate, it's going to be um, tough getting consensus on anything, uh, let alone on, on cannabis. But it's, it's uh, another mile marker in this arc toward reform. Yeah. And I, to what you were saying, Sherry, it seems like there's just, you know, more and more like destigmatization destigmatization going on every time this comes up and is presented. So hopefully we're getting there little by little. Um, well, speaking of the Senate, um, Chuck Schumer announced to a press conference that he is aiming to formally file his much anticipated bill to federally legalize marijuana in April. What are your thoughts regarding the bill or its eminent filing? Well, we've been here before, so it'll be interesting to see the revised draft, and I have not had a peek at the revised draft, so I can't um, address specifics of the new bill that we're anticipating. Personally, I think the CAOA, as we call it, um, is a more fleshed out bill than the MACE bill. I know the MACE bill has been popular with the industry, but the reality here is when it comes to public safety, you have to deal with the FDA. And there is no question that the gatekeeper to the industry is the FDA. Um, and currently, um, all going on our fourth year, cannabis is legal but for THC. And yet the FDA has done um, little to move um, the product into the mainstream. And in fact, that's what CFCR is focused on now. But um, by and large, this is not good. <laughs> this is, we are in, we are in a log jam, we're in a stall and the federal agency that really holds the keys to opening up um, federally legal cannabis is the FDA. Right. Um, we did, we've analyzed the CAOA. We actually had um, a four hour live event where we had people diving into all these different sectors and kind of giving their take on it. Um, so want to get your take on a few of these things that we kind of covered. 
Um, the taxation plan proposed would increase the industry's um, federal taxation burden above current levels, as well as creating burdensome compliance requirements. Um, can the legal cannabis industry survive? You know, I haven't sat down and thought it through um, completely. I can very well tell you the tax is, is crazy. The tax situation is crazy. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, it was an inducement to get states to um, open up their marketplace to cannabis. Now we're faced with taxation that makes it um, pretty much impossible to have um, an industry that is burdened by regulation and by taxes trying to compete with an industry that has none of that. And that would be the um, illicit market. So um, this is part of the socialization process. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. And we, I personally have not figured out how to address it. Um, I don't know of uh, some of the greater minds, but the taxation, I would like to see cannabis not taxed at all. And I would like to see or create a fund um, to actually focus on the harm caused by um, the, frankly, bigoted enforcement of unfair drug laws to begin with. Uh, so instead of taxing um, for government use as it wishes, let's let's create um, let's create a pot of money that we can address some of these issues with. Mm -hmm. These issues being the illicit market and folks that have had their lives and their families ruined. John, what's your take on that? A fund instead of taxing. I think Sharon makes a really important point, and this is going to be one of the, the really. Um, contentious points of tension in, in the transition to federal legalization. So unfortunately, we've gotten the states really comfortable with how much money they can make off of this industry. And this money has become even more valuable when so many state budgets have been impacted by COVID, uh, by the kind of scale of impact that that's had on public health, on, on um, the, the local economies. And so having them reconsider how much they are going to be collecting uh, uh, from cannabis, having them consider lower taxes, both to, to offset or be, to be more competitive against the illicit, illicit market, as well as to reduce the impact of the additional layer of federal taxation on top of the state taxes. It's going to be a really tough sell. Um, you look at a state like California, where depending on where in the state you live, you're paying 50% taxes. Uh, the state, the state's cannabis industry continues to really struggle, um, and the, the high tax burden that they carry plays a significant part uh, in, in in that. But there's going to be it's going to be very very difficult to negotiate an agreement where uh, the state is giving up some of its earnings so that the federal government can then take a piece of their pie. Um, the calls for the reallocation of cannabis revenue to undo, uh, to undo the gross inequities of uh, prohibition enforcement to um, minimize the, the uh, kind of social and public health uh, risks that might come from those who might need uh, uh, support, public health support, um, is, is an ongoing debate. Some states have actually allocated a, a fair amount of their revenues toward those kind of social programs. Um, but again, for cash-strapped states who are seeing, you know, um, real estate taxes fall, commercial business taxes fall, uh, and huge healthcare-related uh, expense uh, expenditures due to COVID, um, you know, the 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 idea of taking really um, necessary capital away from the general fund and allocating it to, to kind of a specific programs, um, again, becomes a tough sell in a season where uh, states are, are quite squeezed. So the, I think one of the key points to look for in the Schumer bill is going to be what is the revised proposed tax level? Um, that was probably one of the areas where there was the widest gap between what Schumer proposed versus what Mace proposed. Um, and if they're still talking about a 20 to 25 percent federal tax over on top of uh, state taxes, uh, then that could be, you know, that, that could start to feel like a death knell for the industry, or at least make for a Herculean uh, lift to, to, for the industry to compete uh, against the illicit market. Yeah, it's certainly not, you know, business friendly. Um, Sherry, we're going to dive into FDA. So the draft legislation doesn't provide much clarity into FDA regulation of cannabis or the scope of the power to regulate the industry as a whole. Um, 
talk to us about this because I know you said it's it's the gatekeeper to <laughs> getting this uh, through. Well, you start with the fact that the FDA has not deemed cannabis safe for the reasons, um, and you can pick a whole bunch of reasons. So if a product isn't safe, it's not going to get into the um, general population and become a product of trade. And we need um, to get, frankly, uh, ahead of the FDA in there and uh, further conversation on what the situation is with safety. Um, we at CFCR are currently putting together a safety matrix um, one of our um, committee chairs uh, was a leader at the FDA, uh, a senior advisor to the administrator. And we're going to try to address the agency's concerns about safety. And if we can, then guidelines from the FDA should begin to be formulated and come out by the end of the year. Now, um, hemp cannabinoids are legal but you cannot have them in product because the FDA said so. And the FDA's jurisdiction comes into effect when you ship it across state lines. So that's how otherwise it's up to the states and it's, it's state law. So once the FDA uh, acknowledges or determines or feels there's sufficient data, always data to approve um, CBD as a safe product, then it, will start to regulate CBD and other cannabinoids. Once that happens, that is, if you will, the proverbial okay, and then other agencies can start getting involved. We will talk to the SBA, for example, but SBA can't begin to do anything, including making loans to people who sell, for example, any kind of cannabinoid product, even if it doesn't have THC in it. Um, so again, that's why I'm saying SBA, I mean, FDA, is the gatekeeper for the federal agencies. And when it comes to regulating health claims, that will be within the jurisdiction of the FDA. You want a science agency regulating health claims and regulating pharma. That's pretty much um, a, 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 a clear rule. Um, and in terms of um, THC, um, I think the government has pretty much shown us that they're comfortable with uh, TTB, which regulates alcohol, to regulate intoxicants from the cannabis plant. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, a lot of questions about labeling. Um, that could be shared responsibility between TTB and um, FDA. Um, one over the other can have um, primary responsibility. But if cannabinoids are treated like vitamins and supplements, all of the regulations for vitamins and supplements would apply and make it easier to move um, cannabinoids other than THC into the um, stream of commerce. I will say that with regard to THC, when it becomes legal and we have claims, in other words, um, this product contains THC, which will relax you and you'll get a good night's sleep, that kind of a claim would come under the FDA because you don't want claims that are going to be um, fool the public, for example, because our goal here at CFCR is to help have a safe industry that consumers know what they're getting. And that's part of what the FDA does. So again, really simply, FDA claims pharmaceutical, um, when THC is legal, recreational uh, or adult use, however it is called, and if a THC product wants to make a claim, then that will be um, overlooked by the FDA and determined by the FDA. Great. John, I want to take I want to get your take on this, but Sherry, as far as these like cannabis derivatives and synthetic compounds that are just happening and people are innovating at such a rapid rate, how do you think that these regulars can keep up with that? I don't think for that. Mean. And that's exactly why we put, that's one of the reasons we put CFCR together, because it, it, I think we all can see that the regulators can't keep up. They can't keep up with enforcement. They can't keep up with understanding the new developments in the marketplace. They still think this is some kind of evil weed, many of them that, you know, is going to make you um, do things you wouldn't do normally. So uh, enforcement, FDA is using its discretionary enforcement just in terms of making sure that people are not terribly fooled by claims that say that this is gonna uh, cure COVID. 
Um, but we don't have the manpower. Um, we don't have the dedication. We don't have the forces to, um, to do a lot about it right now. And we need to get this chaotic market and it extends to other alternative therapies as well. Um, and the agency just frankly needs more money because again, no matter what, safety first for all of us. And that is the FDA's um, jurisdiction. Right, John, were you gonna jump in and ask a question? Yeah, I'm actually gonna have a question for Sherry. So I'm, I'm really curious about how you think the issue of smoking cannabis was going to settle in the FDA. So our data shows that not only does you know, the combustible side of this market remain about half of the products uh, that are currently being sold, and uh, there's been very strong durability on, on the combustion side. Um, you know, is this an issue, this, this issue of you know, the majority uh, or near majority of the product being consumed currently is being, being, uh, being smoked? You know, is this an issue that the FDA is going to take as it, as it um, addresses the broader regulatory framework? Or do you think they'll, they'll keep it more narrowly focused just on the cannabinoids, on the compounds, without also simultaneously addressing the ingestion mechanism? You know, I'm glad you asked that question, John, because that's really difficult. We know how the FDA feels about inhalants into the lungs. Um, we don't know, and I have heard people try to tell me, and I don't know whether it's true or not, that CBD ameliorates some of the problems. So I think that is going to be a sticky wicket. I think in the um, recreational side, when THC is made legal, then I, you know, I, I think that's also going to be a sticky wicket, but I think it will end up at the, um, at the um, TTB. Now, the question of whether smoking is more efficacious or vaping is more efficacious, we have no data to understand it. I know we've made claims. We have some of the scientists that have worked in this industry saying it is more efficacious, but the reality is we don't have the data to back it up. So Heather, in answering your question, I can't tell you. <laughs> All to say, it makes sense for me, recreational TTB. Um, I don't see smoking being outlawed. I don't know if it would be um, considered medicinal by the FDA. And therefore, I don't think unless smoking is shown to be more efficacious, um, FDA would get involved other than to say, we do not find this um, acceptable for over-the-counter therapeutic, pharma, anything. But th this is a decade too early to tell. Yeah. Right. Well, speaking on just the burdensome regulations, making it so hard to compete in the illicit market or with the illicit market, uh, Sherry, what do you think the lawmakers can do to mitigate this risk while we try to work towards legalization? I think we, well, here's what I think. I think that the portfolio of cannabis, I think cannabis is in the DPC's portfolio, the Domestic Policy Council, um, which is a council which advises the um, president and helps form the domestic agenda. I think what we need is um, an opportunity to have listening sessions with uh, some of the top people in the United States who make that up and um, talk about what the ramifications of all of this are and how do we handle it? Because this is a very complex problem. And you know, I'll give you a, a quick example of how complex I see it in DC. For, for since 2014, recreational cannabis has been legal in DC, but you couldn't sell it. Now we have businesses all over the place whose livelihood depends on gifting beers or pizza or NFTs and giving, I mean, uh, selling those and then giving you a gift of cannabis. Um, and, and now they are giving out medical uh, recreational licenses in DC and these businesses that have grown relying on the DC government to do nothing are in trouble. And you've got the dispensary owners that have gone through all the stuff to get the license, um, which takes a lot, and it's not fair to either side. So we really need to sit down and start coming up with some ways to deal with it. And I haven't heard of a single good one. John, you're a brilliant mind. Any good solutions that come to mind? <laughs> it's not a solution, but I think it's an important first step. Is candidly, I think lawmakers need to spend a lot more time talking to the diversity of cannabis consumers in the country. I think there's just not yet or, or not a sufficiently good understanding of the spectrum of American society that are cannabis consumers. 
Um, and I think that would do a few things. One, I think, particularly in, in more conservative jurisdictions, uh, it might help ease some of the reflexive uh, assumptions, prejudices, stereotypes uh, that come to mind when you think about uh, cannabis consumers. You know, we, we marvel from our consumer data uh, how truly representative the cannabis consumer is of the cross section of American society. Two, um, is understand the, the legacy or the long history of American use, uh, American cannabis use. Um, and so if we look back, while I do not mean to suggest at all that uh, the, the concerns about public health are unfounded, it's, it's absolutely critical that there's robust framework to, to consider public health um, as, we, as we build a national framework for cannabis regulation in, in, in the country. But I think it's also really important to understand that this plant, this, you know, cannabis as a, as a drug didn't just magically appear a couple of years ago, it didn't magically appear in 2014. Um, it has been present and deeply embedded in American society for a very long time. And so in some respects, some of the fears that um, have proven to be uh, very robust hurdles to overcome toward uh, advancing a regulatory framework um, might actually be allayed if you understand that the people who you're worried about have actually been consuming for the past 20, 30 years and aren't manifesting the, uh, the, the responses, um, whether physiologically, mentally, socially, uh, that, that are driving some of the concerns in, in advancing policymaking. Um, I think the, the kind of a deeper understanding of um, the, how deeply ingrained uh, cannabis has been in our society and, and who the consumer is uh, will lead to a much better informed conversation about um, who this is implicating, the scale of opportunity it presents, uh, the relative harms, certainly compared to, to alcohol and, uh, and tobacco. Um, and hopefully then we can have a reasoned, uh, slightly more prejudice-free or stereotype-free uh, discussion about a viable policy framework for such a complex issue. Right. It's, uh, well, then we'll have to send them our cannabis consumer report that's coming out in April <laughs> and tell us, give them an idea, give them an idea of, you know, the diversity there. Um, you know, it's also unfortunate just because we've been, I just saw recently, um, I guess Weed Maps submitted a commercial for the Super Bowl that got rejected this year. Um, and it made me kind of look back at some of the past years that were also rejected. And there's, I mean, there's some powerful and it, it's not necessarily an ad for cannabis, but maybe just advocacy and education and learning about how medical cannabis affects patients of all ages and races. And it's, it, it was really really quite powerful so it's unfortunate that we can't put those on those platforms to you know enlighten more people um well we touched on this a little bit sherry um the republican um uh, representative nancy mace of south carolina so do you think that like between these two bills is there a potential to like bridge the partisan gap or how how can do you think there's any kind of compromise between the two you know, it's funny, I don't see them so differently. I Where I do see a big difference is the taxation portion of it. Yeah, and that's major. Mm -hmm. I just think that that, you know, in terms of what's going to happen in the absence of the FDA, it, it doesn't matter because the FDA, again, what, I understand the argument. Um, we've made it to the safety agencies with regard to hemp cannabinoids. It's been around forever. I've got, you know, they gave it, to, you've heard the, the stories, including her doctor, um, Queen Victoria's doctor gave it to her for menstrual cramps. Um, and Indian hemp has been around forever. And we all know this, um, but that many people have tried to make that argument to many of the safety agencies. It hasn't worked. I agree with you, John, but it is not um, what you call scientific data. Um, so I, I may have missed answering your question because I was sort of um, going back to what John said. Would you um, would you want to clarify or have I answered? <laughs> no, I think I mean, I, I just think that there it seems like the excise tax is going to be the biggest differentiator and definitely more business friendly and um, seems like it would just kind of keep it more to the states, which is what a lot of people seem to want to have happen, I, so. I think it's great that Mace has a bill out there to socialize with the, with the uh, Republicans. I think the Republicans need a lot more socialization. Right. Um, we all do. We all have a lot to learn. 
um, and think about and unintended consequences. Today, I still am not sure. I know I've never thought through all the unintended consequences that may come um, from the passing of the safe banking bill. I just, you know, it's not our bailiwick and we don't drill into it, but I can see why Cory Booker took the position he did too. Right. Well, any, yeah, I, um, any I think oh, the, the, you make a really important point and, and I, I want to be clear that there is no substitute for the very long overdue research that needs to be done on cannabis. And I, part of what amazes me is this idea that if you look across all of the US states now, there's over 40 conditions that fall under um, qualifying conditions across these medical cannabis programs. And increasingly, even in New York, you've seen um, the, the state regulators basically say, if your doctor thinks it can work for you, uh, then, then you're welcome to be a participant in this program. If it is true that cannabis is efficacious for such a broad spectrum of, of medical conditions and based on at least what we're hearing anecdotally from patients, uh, the, the feedback has been profoundly positive. Um, one would think that this would be, it would have all the makings for a moonshot project. Uh, find out all of the ways in which we can innovate new therapies with, with this plant that can be grown abundantly at scale, low cost, and implicate, public, implicate the public's health across some of the most uh, endemic and, and uh, kind of challenging medical conditions in, in, our, in our public health. And, and so, you know, the, the human stories, I think, provide a basis to, to kind of begin a conversation. Um, but the, the investment in very robust medical research, one is long overdue, and two is, is absolutely critical given um, the various ways in which people, the, the various and very broad diversity of ways in which people are using medical cannabis and the opportunity to dramatically advance uh, health outcomes if it does what it says on the box. Right, couldn't agree more. Um, Sherry, any predictions for the cannabis industry in 2022? Um, I would give a 50% chance that the FDA will come out with guidelines um, to address both CBD, the drug exclusion rule, which says that CBD is not allowed at all because it was pre it is uh, prior, it, was, it is a drug called Epidilex. So guidelines which would expand the research and the industry far more than just legalizing one state or even two states. Um, and I think that personally, if I were to wager, this is, a, a, again, a crapshoot, I would say safe banking may, may pass at the end of September. And that is just gut instinct. <laughs> Seven right. If it does pass in September, you have to come back on and we can <laughs> discuss it. Oh, I'll, I'll discuss it in, in great detail. <laughs> John, any, anything to add? Any expectations for you for 2022? Um, I love Sherry's outlook. If safe bank banking um, or any of these other measures were to get a good shot in September, the, the catalytic effect that that would have, um, I think is, is hard to overstate. Um, but, you know, e even absent federal regulation and the federal climate is, is, is quite contentious. Um, you know, we, we continue to monitor the emergence of these East Coast markets very closely. I think New York and New Jersey, New York specifically, um, is, is going to put a, a different type of spotlight than we have seen in cannabis thus far. Um, we'll see how far they get in actually activating the market this year. Um, but this combination of New York being the world's largest media market, New York having the most robust social equity framework in place for, for their state, it, it being the financial capital of the world. I mean, all of these factors converging in a single state, um, you know, it does not uh, uh, preempt federal legalization by any stretch. Um, but in terms of being another very visible um, uh, development in, an, in, in the industry, I think it's going to be the next best thing. Awesome. All right. Well, before we wrap up, um, Sherry, we offer our guest um, the ability to give a shout out to someone in the industry that you think is doing amazing things. So you have the floor to give whoever you'd like a shout out. I have to give a shout out to our executive director, Sarah Chase. She came from the Alan Alda Center at uh, SUNY, State University of New York for Communicating Science and knew nothing about cannabis six months ago. 
Um, granted, she had an incredible education putting together the communication center in, at SUNY um, and working with Alan Alda. And this job was just amazing. What she has been able to do, the things she's, the relationships, the partnerships. Um, Sarah Chase, big shout out to you. You have been sensational and we all thank you for the progress you have helped us to make. That's wonderful. She's lovely. I had a chance to meet her in uh, Vegas at um, MJ Biz. So it was great. She's great. All right. Well, thank you both so much for your time. And thank you to our listeners for joining us at Canada Week. Please be sure to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And if you really like us, leave us a five-star review. And you can check out, if you have four hours to kill, our uh, CAOA uh, recording uh, by visiting newfrontierdata.com backslash cannabis dash events. I am your host, Heather Wickline, and we will see you next time.